think we got uh, one of our favorite uh, teacher preachers uh, up here. Amen. And um, I can tell you one thing. This man puts his mouth where his heart's at. Is that a good way to put <laughs> well, that? Well, I guess, but he lives what he teaches. He lives what he preaches. And I think... Uh, and he sees signs and wonders following. And we expect to see him following tonight. him here tonight. Amen. So Thurman, God bless you and welcome. Lord, good to be here with you. Glory. It's good to be back <clears throat> one more time with GLC. <clears throat> the Lord is doing a wonderful work in our life, I will have to say. It's been a great and awesome privilege to serve the King. I never, ever, ever dreamed a few years ago as an engineer in the workplace that I'd ever be a full-time pastor and traveling around the country teaching God's Word and seeing Him do the wonderful things that He's doing. It was beyond my wildest dreams. But when the Lord calls you out to do something, you, either, you only have one alternative. That's either to do what He said or die. So I didn't want to die, so I wanted to do what He wanted me to do. So I started going around the country. And in the last three years since I've been a full-time pastor of a church, if there's anything I've ever realized, that the world needed a Savior. The church is messed up. Amen. Not only the world. But the church is messed up. And it's unfortunate that the enemy sends angels of light into the church to deceive us. And he sure has done a good job on most of us, including me. But tonight I'm going to start out with a scripture to prove to you, I asked my church Sunday this question. And I don't know what percentage of them answered this question positively the first time around, but about 95 to 98 percent. But I asked this question down close to Tyler the other day in a church I was at, and I think 100 percent of them answered the question, yes, and they were 100 percent of them wrong. And the reason I do this is because I taught this wrong for years, and I didn't teach it from the Word. I taught it from hearsay. And it's amazing how we can hear something all of our life and never really check it out against what the Word says and how you can be so wrong. And every day that I spend with God in this Word, it's amazing how as I study this book and read it, and especially when I use the Hebrew and Greek to read it, how often I find out as I research it in detail there's things I taught 10 years ago, 20 years ago in Bible study as a deacon and a Sunday school teacher that I was wrong. I thought I was right. And from what I observed, I thought, wow, you know, I can't be wrong. But even sometimes when you look at the Word, you're wrong. And now I understand why we're so messed up in the church. Because I've been messed up in so many areas and I'm continuing to get revelation. I don't know whether the Lord is just beginning to open our understanding to things today or what. But I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to think about this question for a minute. <clears throat> How many of you have heard that you are the bride of Christ? How many preachers have taught that the church is the bride of Christ, the Lamb's wife? It would be interesting if I could see you out there on the other end of television world to see how many of you right now are holding up your hand. If you believe you are the bride of Christ, hold up your hand. Well, until just a few years ago, if somebody asked me that question, I would have held up my hand. Now, why would I have held up my hand on that? Because I had heard all of my life that the church is the bride of Christ, the Lamb's wife. A few years ago, I was reading the book of Revelation, and I don't know how many times I'd read it, 
but had never become a revelation to me until this certain day. One day I was reading this over in Revelations chapter 21, and I came upon this little topic. And I know that I'm not the only one in the world that's ever done this. Sometimes I feel like I am. That I've read the scriptures time and time and time again, and I thought I had the answers. And then I realized, just like this question tonight, how wrong I was. Like I say, if you had asked me a few years ago, are you the bride of Christ? I would have said yes. But I want to read something to you out of Revelation chapter 21. And you might get your Bible and follow along with me because maybe your Bible reads different than mine. But this is why it's so important that you don't believe anything you hear if it's not confirmed at least with the written word of the living God. So I'm going to show you how I was deceived because I had heard from Sunday school teachers and from preachers on television, everywhere, I had heard many people, and I taught it that way. And of course, you could have very well go back. Some of you may go back and say, well, I saw you on a particular television channel 10 years ago, and you made that statement yourself, if you can remember that far back. Some of you may have some of my tapes, and I may have made a statement about the bride of Christ and said we're the bride of Christ. But if you got one of those tapes I made years ago, you're going to find out it was wrong too. So the revelation we get on a regular basis, I want you to think about what I'm going to read here in Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to start with verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's what he said he saw. The city adorned, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So you think, well, okay. That kind of got my attention. But then when I got just a few verses further down in chapter 21, I come to verse 9. <clears throat> and verse 9 it says, and there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. And he talked with me saying, come here, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. That's pretty, pretty clear, isn't it? I'm going to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Okay. I thought, well, I wonder who she is. I thought, I don't have to worry about that. I know who she is. It's the church. And then verse 10 says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. The Lamb's wife. Isn't that strange that the Lamb's wife is a city? It's a city. And he carried me away in the spirit in a, to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And that is the Lamb's wife. I thought, so the church is not the bride of Christ at all. I, th I wondered, anyway, I thought, how in the world can I be the body of Christ and be his bride? <clears throat> and then it all made sense to me for the first time in my life. I'm not the bride of Christ. I'm the body of Christ. Last night as my wife and I, of course, that two, those two beautiful ladies that just sing, they're my own worship and praise team. The older one, if you could tell which one that was, they both look beautiful and young. The older one was my wife, and the younger one is her daughter. But they're my own beautiful worship and praise team. But last night, <clears throat> as we sat there in the hotel, I was talking about the unity that we have with Christ, with my bride. I told her, I said, you know, God has made us so close to himself that it would be impossible for us to be any closer. If we were, we would actually be above the Godhead. He made us organic unity with himself. We are the literal cells because he calls us fingers and arms and 
so forth. We are the body of Christ. We are not the bride. But I don't know. That might not be a revelation to you. Many of you may already know that. But it's amazing in the last two churches, one of them including my own, that I asked that question in, one of them was 100% wrong. 100% of the people said they were the bride of Christ. In fact, one of the ladies came up to me after the service. I taught a healing school there for about four or five hours on a Saturday. <clears throat> one of the ladies came up to me after it was over and she said, Sir, I have been taught I am the bride of Christ all of my life. She said, if I were to go back home to my church and show them in the book of Revelation where I am not the bride and we, the church, is not the bride, she said, they would probably throw me out of my church. I said, isn't it amazing how we read and interpret the Word of God incorrectly? <clears throat> it is kind of amazing. It would be interesting for you, if you're watching this show tonight, it would be interesting if you would call us, of course, we have a number uh, on the screen and we have a ministry number. And of course, we, the, in fact, the, the CD that Cheryl, my wife, and her daughter sing that song, uh, all these songs that they'll be singing the next couple of nights, uh, Cheryl has written that music and put the music to it and everything. God has really gifted her. <clears throat> and any of you that would like to have that CD, uh, it has six songs on it now, and shortly it'll have ten. But any of you that would like to have that song, if you'll call our ministry center, it's a number that we'll put on the screen. It's on the screen right now, I think. If you'll call that number, we will be happy to send you that CD free and postpaid. But those two girls, they're really anointed, and they are really blessed. And I'm blessed to have them, and I'm grateful to the Lord. But when I think about how I have been deceived in my years as a man going to church and how I took the Word of God that was taught me in church and I never took the time to read this book for myself in detail. I've now come to realize that's the problem with the church, even myself. I read this book in detail, but I still have so little revelation on it. I know that God says in His Word, we're not to become a master of many different things in the Word because it's impossible for us, this book, to become a master of all things. So most of the revelation He's given me in this book revolves around healing. The Lord Himself came to me 27 years ago and spoke to me in an audible voice. That was a great revelation. I had no idea that the Lord would speak to people in an audible voice. But the first time he spoke to me in an audible voice, it so got my attention. And of course, as he continued over the years, he built my faith. Second time he spoke to me in an audible, audible voice, he, and when I say audible, it sounds audible to me. It's just like I'm hearing my voice right now. And when I hear that voice, it just blows me away. In fact, I was speaking in a large conference the other day with a very large ministry. And the man has got about 2,000 employees working for him, I believe, he said. And he said, Thurman, I've been in the ministry for 50 plus years. I have never heard that voice, that authoritative, audible voice. I told him, I said, well, sir, maybe the Spirit speaks to you and you're not as hard-headed as I am. I said, maybe that I'm so hard to get through to, the only way God can get through to me is speak to me audibly. I don't know. But I said, you know, you might be amazed at the people that has heard God's voice if you were to ask that question. He said, well, I've never asked that question. I said, well, since you've never heard it, doesn't mean he's not talking to other people. <clears throat> so we got in the car with three other men, and he asked the question. He said, have any of you men ever heard the authoritative or audible voice of God? And much to his amazement, two out of the three had heard it. And I thought, that's amazing. So we go over to a makeup room. We were fixing to be on film. They were going to, it wasn't television, but they were going to video uh, the teaching we were going to do that day. So we went to the makeup room and they were going to make us up 
try to make us look a little better for television if that was possible. And there was two beautiful young ladies in there in their early 20s. I asked the question, have either one of you young ladies ever heard the authoritative or audible voice of God? Immediately, one of the young ladies said, I have. The other one said, I never have. I asked the one that said she had, I didn't ask the two men, but I asked this one, I said, young lady, would you mind telling us your experience with God? She said, oh no, I'll be happy to share it with you. I said, have you, do you ever share it with nobody? Anybody? She said, nobody ever asked. And I said, well, that's sound, that stands to reason that nobody asked because people don't like to talk about this because most people don't believe God talks anymore. But I said, all through the scripture, he's talked. And I said, since he spoke in the scripture, God never changes. He said, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I said, you might be amazed at how many people he does talk to. So as we started talking to different people, we found out that he does talk to a lot of them. But this young girl, she said, I'll be happy to share my story with you. She said, when I was four years old, I was in laying in my bed and I heard it sounded like my daddy called my name. I'll just use the name Elizabeth. I said, Elizabeth? Elizabeth. And she said, that's daddy. So she said, I got up and went into daddy's room and I said, daddy, did you call me? He said, no, honey, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So she said, I went back in my bedroom and I went to bed. She said, I lay there for a little while and I heard Elizabeth, Elizabeth. And she said, that's daddy. So she, she, she got up, went in there again. She said, daddy, you're calling me. He said, no, honey, I didn't call you. So she said, I went back to bed. I said, I'm laying there now and I'm wondering, what was that? And so I heard again, Elizabeth, Elizabeth. And she said, who is it? And the voice said, it's God. Well, what do I need to do? He said, it's time for you to accept me as your Lord and Savior. Lord. She said, I fell off the side of my bed as a four-year-old girl and accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But she said, that's the only time I've ever heard it. I thought, wow, isn't that awesome? God speaks to people and he speaks to us in many different ways. Many people I have spoken to since then, I've started asking that question. Lots of places where I go, uh, whenever the Lord inspires me, I'll just ask the question, have you ever heard the authoritative voice of God? And it's been amazing. In fact, when I was down at this conference that I was speaking at, I was staying in one of the homes of one of the people there on the conference grounds, a beautiful couple. You know, they had a young girl that was 30 years old, grown. I guess she's 30 years old, somewhere in that neighborhood. She's already grown. She's away from home, but they was a lovely couple. And just to tell you how men and women don't share with each other the things of God between each other. I was sitting there at breakfast with this lovely couple, born again, wonderful Christian people. And I asked the question that morning at breakfast. I said, have either one of you ever heard the audible voice of God? The wife looked over at the husband. He looked at her and then he looked at me and he said, well, I never have heard it. And she said, have you ever heard it? I said, oh yes, ma'am, many times. She looked at me and she said, I've heard it once. I said, would you mind sharing with us what happened? Now think about this. This is a man and a woman married and they've been married probably 35 years. She said, no, I'll be, I will, sh I will share it with you. But she says, uh, I don't think right now is the time. I said, okay, no problem. So I didn't press her. In a few minutes, <clears throat> her husband left to go outside. When he left to go outside, she said, now I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me. I thought, this is strange that she will share this with me, but she won't share it with me and her husband. She said, when my daughter was a young girl in her teens, she said, in the middle of the night, I heard a voice. I was awakened, a voice called my name. And I woke and said, the Lord spoke to me 
and says, My dear, claim Mark chapter 16, verse 18, that no deadly poison shall hurt you. And she said, What? This woman had never been taught that verse. She didn't even know where it was in the Word of God. But the Lord told her where it was in Mark 16, 18. And that's what that verse says. But I haven't met but a handful of Christians in my life that knows that verse is in God's Word, and I've even run into less of them than a handful that's ever claimed that and never seen God do a miracle with it. I've claimed that verse many times and seen God do many mighty, wonderful miracles, even in my own life with Mark 16, 18, that says in the first part of that verse, no deadly poison shall hurt you. Since he's a faith God and you have to claim that by faith, this woman, she claimed that verse. She didn't have a clue what was going on. Didn't have a clue. But she said the Lord had to tell her twice. Finally, she said, okay, no deadly poison shall hurt me. And she said, I didn't have a clue what was going on. But she said, I went back to bed. In fact, I think she told me that the Lord says, claim that no deadly poison will hurt. And she called her daughter's name, whatever it was. And she said, I had no idea why I spoke that. But she said, the next morning when I got up, I was fixing breakfast and my daughter came in and said, Mother, I don't know what happened last night, but I got tired of living last night and I was going to kill myself. I went into the bathroom and I had a bottle of formaldehyde and I turned it up to drink it and when I did something squeezed my throat off and it would not go down. She said, I tried again and something squeezed my throat off and I could not swallow it. So she said, I just spit it out and went back to bed. Isn't that amazing? Let me tell you something. If God's not through with you on this earth, there's not anything can take you out. If he's got a plan for you, he's going to make sure that you stay alive until he's through with you. I know the second time I heard God's voice, I was working as an engineer for a large corporation. And that Monday morning at nine o'clock, I was in Houston, Texas, and I was in under 20,000 pounds of steel. And all of a sudden, out in the middle of nowhere, I heard this voice. Son, you forgot to do your paperwork this morning. I thought a minute and I said, Lord, that's right. I was going to come by the corporate office and do my paperwork this morning and I completely forgot it. But I said, Lord, I only like 15 minutes under here and then I'll run right back over there and do it. He said, no, son, I want you to go do it right now. I thought, well, Lord, I don't know what the big hurry is, but okay. So I crawled out from under that and stood up and took the second step and the supporting structure holding 20,000 pounds of steel exploded. And 20,000 pounds of steel was laying right where I was five seconds before. When I finally regained my composure and got back up off the ground where I'd run trying to get out of the way, although I was already in safety, I never forget that morning when I looked up and I said, Lord, that scripture in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, which says I'm no longer my own. I'm yours. I'm bought with a price the price of the only begotten Son of the living God. He paid an awesome price for the church and I didn't have a clue really what was going on on the earth. I had so little knowledge of this book, but that drove me into a much deeper, closer walk with the King. Over the years, as he has spoken to me many times, many times, he has revealed these scriptures to me in many ways and he's put me into a ministry that for the organization I came out of, I used to belong to an organizational church and they don't teach hardly anything that God shows me in the Word today in the area of healing and deliverance. They just don't believe in it. I didn't believe in it either. But after the Lord showed me these things, I totally changed in the way I'd done business. When he began to speak to me and show me these things, I began to have many questions. Lord, why is it that this happens? What is the problem on this earth? Why is it that some people get sick, some people don't get sick? 
Why is it that some people have accidents and some people don't have accidents? Why is it that one man or one family may go through life and they live to be 80 or 90 years old and nobody in his family has any problem? And the other family, it seems like everything they do, they're plagued. I said, Lord, I got to have some answers. I don't know what's going on. Then one day I was driving down the road and the person with me said, let me read something out of the newspaper to you. I said, okay. The title of the article was What Makes a Difference? Some of you may have seen that. This was several years ago when this was read to me. What makes the difference? The article was read. There was two families. One of those men and women were both Christians. And the, those two that were Christians, they married each other and they continued to walk as Christians believing the things of God. And out of that union, there was like seven or eight hundred descendants over 150 years that came out of that union. Two holy people becoming one. It told how many of those people were doctors, lawyers, school teachers, good workers, Sunday school teachers, deacons in churches, all kinds of good things. Not one single one of them went wrong. And I thought, how unique that is. They started out one Christian man, one Christian woman becoming one, and all that 750, 800 people over 150 years come to Christ, and all of them done good things for society. And then it says there was another man and another woman that did not believe in Christian things, and those two became one and got married. And over the next 150 years, there was like 1,200 descendants come from them. And out of those 1,200 descendants, it told how many of them went to prison. It told how many of them were drug addicts. It told how many of them were prostitutes. It was just on and on and on. And it told how many millions of dollars that family cost the state of New York. I thought, Lord, what, what makes this difference? That, that was the title of that article in the newspaper, what made the difference. It was pretty obvious that the difference was one family believed in things written in this book and the other family did not. Then one day when I really come to this book and started reading this book in detail, I came to scriptures like Deuteronomy chapter 28 under the Old Testament, under the law, that everywhere that you would read it said, if you will be obedient and do everything I tell you to do in this book, if you'll keep my commandments and my statutes, I will bless not only you, but your children. I will bless everything you put your hands to. I will bless you. I will bless the fruit of your womb, which is your children, and your lands, your houses, your cattle. Everything you do will be blessed. And whatever you do, I will bless it. And you will not be the bar, but you will be the lender. You will be blessed financially if you'll keep all of my commandments. I read 14 verses there and I thought, boy, that's where I want to live. And then I came to verse 15 and it says, but if you will not keep my commandments and my statutes, all these curses will come upon you and your family. And right there, I began to understand why we have the problems on this earth. The more I read the book, the more I begin to understand this invisible realm that Paul says we fight against. He told us in the book of Corinthians that there's three heavens. Number one, the first heaven is right here. You and I can see it. We can feel it. We can smell it. We can taste it. We can hear it. We can operate in this heaven that we see with our five physical senses. But he said there's another heaven called the second heaven. And I have now realized that second heaven is included in this same space where the first heaven is, the only difference between the two. One of them's visible, one of them's invisible. The one that's invisible is where the demonic world lives. They're in this second heaven. And then, of course, there's a third heaven where God is. But in this second heaven, Paul tells us that there is beings 
principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. And he said, we wrestle with those guys. And I thought, how can we be wrestling with these guys? You can't see them. You don't know where they are. You don't understand them. I certainly didn't understand them. So I began to read this book over the years, studying it in detail. And then finally, I got the revelation. As I read scriptures, I'm going to read a scripture to you out of 1 John 5. This was really the one that really, really grabbed my attention one day. As I read down through here, 1 John chapter 5, Starting at verse 13, he said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Anything. And if we honor, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that he, we have the petition that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, that's amazing. He makes all these promises to us right here that we can ask for these mighty things. And then verse 16, he says, if any man sees his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death. And I thought, if any man sees his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. And I thought, Lord, what is the sin unto death? You know, I've read this book in detail from cover to cover many times. I found a few things that was sin unto death. In fact, many of you may remember over in the book of Acts, there was two people, a man and a woman, Ananias and Sapphira, that committed to sin unto death. But what they did is not to sin unto death every time. That's what's so strange. How can one thing be a sin unto death this time and not a sin unto death next time? But Ananias and Sapphira both lied to the Lord. And when they lied, both of them died instantly. Now, I'm going to make a bold statement here tonight. I'm going to tell you that if, a, if every time one of us sinned, we was killed, there wouldn't be a single person in this building tonight. Not one single person. We would all be dead. There's not anybody in the world that hadn't told a lie of some kind somewhere. But they, they lied to God. And that was the difference. We lie to each other over silly little things. But people lie. You know, it's just something people do. I have tried my best to totally, completely not tell any kind of a lie, any kind. But it's very, very difficult not to do that. Sometimes under certain conditions, somebody asks you something and you make a little mistake, but you have to try your best not to lie. But we know that lying to the Holy Ghost two times in this Bible was a sin unto death. Well, since he doesn't tell us what the sin unto death is, he goes on and makes another statement here. He says, There is a sin unto death. I do not say that you shall pray for it. Then he says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. And I'm certainly grateful for that. In verse 18, the statement he makes here next is when I begin to doubt whether I was a Christian or not. And you might be where I was. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. If you're born of God, you're not supposed to sin. I thought, Lord, I can't possibly be your child because I know I sin every once in a while. I know I do. I had to go back to the Greek and check that out, and it says God's children does not practice sinning. It doesn't mean you won't never sin, but that's the goal, never to sin. Then he says, as he goes on, he said, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And then here's the statement that really got me to thinking. If you do keep yourself from all sin, that wicked one, which is Satan, cannot touch you. 
That's an awesome statement. I've made that statement on several of my training videos and things, and I had a woman here a while back call me, and she said, I was listening to one of your videos, and I heard you make that statement in 1 John 5, and she said, I have been in church all of my life. My husband and I are in the church. We've been in it. We've taught the Word of God. She said, I've taught that book of John, and she said, I'm telling you, she said, I hit pause on your tape and said, I know that's not what that says. She said, I'm going to go back and look. She said, I got my Bible that went back and said, my Bible said exactly what you said on that tape. She said, I thought, Lord, how have I missed that all of my life? It does make you wonder, doesn't it? How you can read something like that and not get it. But you can miss it. That's why I went at the beginning and started out in Revelations 21 because I'd heard about the bride but I had never really found out what the scriptures really said about who the bride was. So when I found it in the scriptures, it so startled me. I thought, goodness gracious to think I've been wrong about the bride. I'm not the bride at all. But I always wondered how I could be the bride and be the body at the same time. But now I know I'm never going to be the bride. I am the body of Christ. And there's organic unity between me and the Savior. And if you're a born again Christian, it's the same thing. So we are the body. We are going to reign and rule with the King forever as the body of Christ, not as the bride. But when you get a hold of this right here, it says if we do not sin, we don't open the door to the devil. Then I begin to understand people in the church that sin, I begin to understand why so many people were sick and afflicted because sickness and disease comes from the enemy, the devil. So whenever you sin, in whatever way you sin, you open a door to the demonic world. And as you sin in opening that door, I have now come to realize that, and I often wonder this, why, if especially 2,000 years ago, if Jesus came to this earth and he destroyed completely the works of the devil and disarmed him, and all power and all authority was given to him in heaven and in earth, then why did he leave the devil here? There's a lot of good answers to that. Not just one, but several. But one of those is Satan has now become the executive department, you might say, for the spirit world. Think about what I'm going to tell you. Some of you are probably going to disagree with me, but I want you to think about this. In the system we have on this earth, in our law system, we have a legislative department that makes a law. We have a judicial system, which is the courts, which interprets the law. We have an executive department that enforces the law. Now I want you to think about what I'm going to tell you. In Romans chapter 13, the Lord clearly tells us as Christians, we are to obey the laws of the land. Now you would think if God told the church to obey the laws of the land, there would never be a church member that would break a law. You would think that if we're supposed to be obedient and die to sin, and we're never to sin, that if the legislative department would make a, a rule out here on the highway that said the speed limit on the highway is 60 miles an hour, and they put signs up and down the side of the road that says maximum speed, 60 miles an hour, absolutely no Christian would ever break that law, would they? Unfortunately, they do. And since they do, and you may be one of those that do that, I know when I was a young man, I did that all the time. I mean, I did it so many times as a Christian, they even took my driver's license away from me. You know, I didn't obey the law. I didn't really know I was supposed to obey from the Word of God. I did know I wasn't supposed to speed. I knew that. But since I did speed and the legislative department made the law, the executive department enforced it. They put a police officer out there to keep me in line. And when I broke the law, they picked me up, they gave me a ticket, and I paid the consequences. I've now realized that the executive department in the spirit world is the devil and his demons. Satan cannot bat an eyelash without approval from God. He cannot do nothing. But since he's totally defeated, totally destroyed, totally disarmed, if you don't sin, that beast cannot touch you. He cannot touch you, he cannot touch your family as long as all of you walk in total obedience to God's Word. 
When I learned these principles and learned how to walk in faith, now some of you are going to think I'm crazy, but I stopped sinning. Just like when I go down the road, I don't break the speed limit. When I drive down that road out there, if it says 60, I set my cruise control on 60. If it says 70, I set it on 70. If it says 35, I drive 35. I do everything in my power to obey every law of this land I can. And you know how many years it's been since I've been stopped by a police officer? I don't even remember the last time, but I don't break the law. Since I don't break the law, I don't have to worry about the executive department. But I also learned how to walk in faith and walk like the Lord told me to walk in His Word and obedience to it 20 years ago. And although I didn't know that, the first 45 years of my life, the enemy beat open me pretty severely with sickness and disease the first 45 years of my life. But the last 20 years of my life, since I started reading this book and being obedient to it and walking in love and doing what the Lord says, I, have, I can stand before you today and say, praise God, because of the Word of God and because of faith in the Word of God, I have been able to walk to the age of almost 66. I'll be 66 in December. I have not had one sick day in the last 20 plus years. That's a wonderful place to walk. I don't have to even be concerned about waking up in the morning and being sick. If you walk in love and you walk in faith, the promises of God will work for you. I'll give you an example. My bride, Cheryl, the beautiful lady that was singing there a while ago, her and her daughter, we went out of town to preach the other day, and of course she had a knee that's given her a little trouble. And so we went to bed that night, and her knee was bothering her. She couldn't sleep, and I went right off to sleep. I sleep good. And uh, she tried to, a couple times gently to wake me up. She wouldn't do anything. I told her, why didn't you shake me? She said, well, you were sleeping so good I didn't want to wake you up. But about 5 o'clock in the morning, she got up to get out of bed. She was hurting so bad, and when she got out of bed, she woke me up. And so I saw her limping across to the bathroom, and I got up and I said, Honey, something wrong with you? She said, My knee's been hurting all night. She said, It's in such pain, but I've prayed and prayed over it, and nothing's happened. I said, Come over here and sit down on the bed. She comes, sat down on the bed. I quoted Matthew 18, 19, in faith. And I asked the Lord to take away her pain and completely heal her knee. And then I said, Lord, since you hadn't had any sleep all night, and Cheryl and I are going to have to sing, she's going to have to sing, and I'm going to have to teach the Word of God at this church. I said, I ask you to anoint her supernaturally so she'll have the strength just as if she'd had 10 or 12 hours of sleep. Within minutes, her pain went away, standing on a promise in God's Word, Matthew 18, 19. Now, if you're obedient to serve the Lord and do what He says. As we read there in 1 John 5, anything you ask the Lord for, He hears you and you have your petition. Matthew 18, 19 promises that if two of us on earth agree about anything we ask Him for, providing we're walking in obedience to His Word, He will do it. And I ask on, in faith on behalf of that verse, and in a matter of just a few minutes, all of Cheryl's pain was gone. And she got up early that morning, got ready, and we went and preached the Word and done everything, and I have never seen her have as much energy as she had that day. And she didn't even get tired again until 11 o'clock that night, and she had been up, I guess, 30-something hours, 36 hours almost before she went to bed again. It's amazing what you can do in faith. She says she doesn't understand how I can pray over myself every day and live on three to five hours of sleep a night, but I've been doing that for years. She can't do that, but by faith I do that and stay in healthy doing it all. But when you stop and think about what the Lord has said here in His Word, there is a sin unto death and there is a sin that's not unto death. If all sin is unrighteousness, if the church would read that Scripture and believe it, the church would stop sinning. Or there would be many of them would begin to understand why they have the sickness and disease and why they die early. Since I've learned these things, every time I sit down with someone, I want to know where your sin is. And it's amazing. In fact, the other day, I was ministering at a place, and there was a 64-year-old man. 
He wanted me to come back to where he was. He'd had a stroke about six or eight years ago. He couldn't get up and walk up to the front. He's younger than I am. I went back there to pray over him. And his wife was in almost as bad a shape as he was. And she said, before you pray over him, I want you to pray over our grandson. I said, what's wrong with your grandson? She said, he has autism. I said, tell me about his mother and daddy. How long they've been married? She said, well, they've been living together for 11 years and they're not married. I said, ma'am, there's no way I can get that boy healed. There's no way. I said, that boy is the way he is because of his mother and daddy's sin. God said in his word, if a mother and, or if a man and a woman have sex outside of wedlock, he'll curse not only you, but your children. If people believe that today, and that's probably outside of unbelief, the biggest sin in the church today is sex sins. Amen. People are committing sex outside of wedlock, not realizing the consequences. But that's why so many children are born handicapped, mentally retarded, organs missing, everything. It's just amazing when you get a hold of these things. In fact, we have a lady working for us at our ministry. And this lady is a wonderful lady and she had a good friend, relative of hers that lived with a boy and brought a little girl into the world. Just a few days after the girl was born, the girl was on her deathbed with a liver failure. Three or four days old. She went over to the relative and found out the girl had been living with a young man out of wedlock. If you don't know these principles, you think, well, that's just, just the way it is. The little girl's just going to die. It makes you wonder how one brand new baby comes into the world totally healthy, lives 80, 90 years, and the next one comes in and the liver fails in three or four days. Don't make sense, does it? Well, let me tell you, it's blessings and curses. That's what it is. So this little girl, when they found out what her problem was with her mother, this lady that works for us in the ministry, she got the young woman to repent of her sins and make God a promise she would not go to bed with that boy again unless she married him. And once the girl repented, then hands was laid on the baby and prayed and the devil was rebuked and the little girl was completely healed in one hour. Lord. That little girl is a year old today and a beautiful little girl because somebody come to her mother that had brought the baby into the world in sin and had told the mother what was the requirements and the mother listened and repented. It's amazing. Sin. Sin brings forth death. All unrighteousness is sin. I'm going to have Cheryl and Christy sing another song here in just a minute uh, while they're getting ready. Uh, I've got just a couple more things I want to say here, but I want the, the girls to sing one of their beautiful songs. And like I say, if you would like to have these songs or any of our tapes or anything that we have, if you'll call the number that they place on the screen once in a while about our ministry center, we will be happy to send you these CDs or these audio video tapes free and postpaid. We have people tonight sitting there uh, ready to take your call if you want to call and get some of our information. We'll send it to you free and postpaid. But one of the things I want to close on here before I take a little break and let the girls sing this song. Remember, <clears throat> all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And sin leads to death. It doesn't always lead to death instantly, but it will lead to death. And that's why a many a person that starts sinning find themselves getting weaker and weaker and weaker and coming down with diseases is because they're sinning. If you stop sinning, like Jesus healed the man, had been down paralyzed all those years, he told him, now I have healed you, I've forgiven you. He said, now stop sinning or something worse is going to come upon you. Well, I want to say one thing about that sermon preaching. Brother, you're as good as anybody I've ever heard, and I appreciate you. I really do. Thank you for being part of GLC. And... Uh, you kept my attention. I want to get back. I, I just can't help but think we had a situation, Thurman, where we were asked to pray for a baby who was born in a terrible condition. Now I've got to ask those questions that he just asked us. Mm -hmm. Are you enjoying Thurman? Absolutely. Let's give him a hand then. <laughs> Uh, 
Praise the Lord. I'm going to start here again on something. I want to say that we as Christians are going to be tempted, tested, and tried. But starting in James chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, which means you're going to go through them. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love Him. Nobody likes to undergo temptation and be tried, but I'm going to assure you, you're going to go through it. The reason you're going to go through it is because the Lord is building a body on this earth to reign and rule with Him through eternity. And I'm going to tell you, He don't want a bunch of wimps. He wants people that is willing to go through these trials and tests and to endure them. And he says, blessed is the man that goes through those things. Now the next verse says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. When those verses became a revelation to me, I realized right there the Lord's trying to tell me that whenever these tests and temptations and everything come, if I yield to them and I begin to act in those sins, they begin to bring forth death. And when death, when the sin is completely finished and full grown, it kills me. I thought, how strange that is, Lord. And so a few years ago, <clears throat> I was down in Louisiana speaking in a church and there was a woman down there and she was there every service and she'd been raised up a Catholic and she was in a wheelchair. After the last service, I went over to her and I said, ma'am, I'd like to pray for you, but before I pray for you, I want to know what your sin is. A lot of people today in the church are praying for people and are getting no results because you're not getting the sins confessed. If you don't get the sin confessed, in fact, let me put it to you like this. If long as the sin remains, the curse remains. And as long as the curse remains, you can't hardly get people healed. You know, they die. But this woman, she was in her mid-60s at the time. And I said, how long have you been in that wheelchair? She said, well, I've been in this wheelchair in and out for two years and then completely in it the last two. So four years ago, I said, why do you believe you're in this wheelchair? She said, well, I'm getting old. I said, no, ma'am. I said, how old are you? She was a beautiful woman. I said, how old are you? Well, she said, I think she said at the time she was 64. I said, 64 is not old. I said, you have just yielded to the devil, and he's deceived you, and he's put you down, and he's making you think that you're in that wheelchair because you're getting older. But I said, I'm going to tell you what's put you in that wheelchair. It's sin. I said, what are you doing that you didn't used to do? Well, she said, well, I really don't know. I said, are you married? She said, no. I said, have you ever been married? She said, oh, yeah, I was married for many years. And she said, about five years ago, my husband died. I said, were you perfectly normal when your husband died? She said, oh, yeah. I said, you were able to run and play and do everything you wanted to do? Oh, yeah. She said, I was perfectly normal. I said, so in the last five years... I said, what kind of church was you raised up in? She said, Catholic. I said, are you a student of the Bible? Well, she said, no, I don't read it very much. She said, somebody told me I needed to come to these meetings while you were here. And so she said, I started coming and said, I was so intrigued by what I learned. I came every night. I said, I know I saw you here every night this week. I said, so let me ask you a question since I've known this scripture here in James chapter 1 that when you start sinning, it starts bringing sickness and disease upon you. And when your sin is fully matured, it brings forth death. I said, that's what's happening to you. Your sin is slowly but surely bringing forth death. She said, I never thought about it like that. I said, now then, 
Tell me what you've done different that you didn't do before when your husband was still alive. She said, well, from what I've heard you say this week, sex sins, sex outside of wedlock sin, isn't it? I said, yes, ma'am, it definitely is. I said, have you been involved in any kind of sex sin since your husband died? She said, well, yes. She said, uh, for about a year, everything went along okay. And then she said, uh, I didn't have nothing to do. Said, I sat out on the front porch and read and, and write or whatever. And she says, uh, I got awful lonesome. And said, I didn't have hardly any friends. So she said, there was a guy in his mid-50s that was a meter reader. And he came by once a month to read the meter and said, I started talking to him. And she said, after a while, I was having a cup of tea with him or whatever. And then first thing you know, she said, we were sexually involved. She said, not very often, usually just once a month, maybe twice at the most. But I said, that's when you started sinning. I said, that's when you were tempted with sin and you yielded to the sin and the sin started a process of death in your flesh. I said, you were inviting demons into your flesh and as the demons came into your flesh, they're killing you slowly but surely. And I said, right here, the Word of God says that whenever your sin is fully matured, it brings forth death. I said, that's what's happening to you. You're yielding to sin. The temptations are there. You're yielding to them. And now then it's beginning to slowly destroy and kill your body. And I said, when it's fully grown, you're going to die. And I said, you can see it. Just your body's going downhill all the time. She said, wow, I didn't know those things. I said, well, I said, God's merciful and gracious. I said, would you be willing to ask him to forgive you? I said, in 1 John 1, 9, the Lord is a very merciful and mighty God. And I said, he will forgive you for your sin. I said, he made a set of rules. And when you break those rules, there's not anything he can do about it. He's no respecter of persons. You break the rules. What he says happens and it happens. And, and he, can't, he can't change it for anybody. I said, it happens to everybody that does this sooner or later. She said, wow, I didn't know that. She said, yes, I will ask him to forgive me. I, and I said, now repent. You know what repent means? She said, well, I think I do. I said, well, repent means to turn from your wicked ways and don't do them no more. Amen. She said, I thought that's what it meant. I said, so you repent and ask God to forgive you next month. And that guy comes by, you don't go to bed with him no more. She said, I understand that. I said, okay. Sometimes I've learned as a preacher that sex sins are not talked about very much in the church, but I've come to realize now there's so many people sick and afflicted in the church because of them, it's time somebody starts talking about them. And so I've started talking about them, and you would be amazed at the people that I've seen healed in these areas in the last few years when I've started talking about this. Seen many mighty, wonderful miracles of healing from people that were involved sexually outside of wedlock, and they were dying. This woman repented. She asked God to forgive her. You talk about a merciful God. Here's a woman about 64 years old that's been in a wheelchair solid for two years, hadn't walked a step in two years, and she repented of her sins. And after she repented, I told her, I said, now then, ma'am, I said, the Lord says you and I can agree upon anything and he'll do it for us. I said, so let's take Matthew 18, 19, the prayer of agreement, and let's ask the Father in Jesus' name to restore your strength back like you were so you can walk again. I said, would you be willing to agree with me that he would do that for you? She said, I will. And so I prayed the prayer of faith for her, and she agreed with me. And I said, now then, ma'am, take my hand and step out of that wheelchair. That woman took my hand and stepped out of that wheelchair. That woman walked off from there, and I was invited back to that same church a year later, which was last March, and when I was there, that woman was still there and that woman is still walking and hadn't had any problems. And when I saw her, I recognized her. She's still a beautiful woman. I told her, I said, ma'am, how are you doing? She said, oh, I'm doing great. I said, you hadn't fell back to your old ways, have you? She said, no way. No way. I am not going back to those old sins. I came home and, of course, I told that story a few times this last year at different places where Cheryl and I preached. And she told me, she said, honey, you need to tell that story often. She said, people need to understand what brings these things upon them. And so we were down in Dallas the other night. 
And I told that same story after I talked on these verses. And there was a 42-year-old woman came up to me after the service for prayer in a walker, 42 years old. She came up and she said, Sir, I had no idea what I was doing. She said, about a year ago, I was perfectly normal. She said, my husband left me. I'm 42 years old. She said, I wanted a partner sexually, and I didn't have one. So she said, I found one and said, I'm not married to him. And she said, I've been sexually active for almost a year. And she said, I'm getting weaker and weaker. I had no idea that's what was putting me in this walker. Isn't it amazing what we don't understand? We read this book and it says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. I guess we don't believe this book. And then the next line says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Do not err. I think we've been taught in the church so long that because we live under grace instead of the law, we can just do anything we want to do and there's no consequence. But that's as far from the truth as you can get. Let me make this statement to you tonight. <clears throat> if you transgress the law of God as a believer, if you're a believer and you're walking wholly before God in a love relationship with God and with all people, and you're walking in faith under grace, and you break God's law, let's say you fall to a sexual sin. When you do, you've just fell from grace, you've transgressed the law, and the devil has legal right to get you. That's absolutely what the Scripture says. Paul told us that in Galatians chapter 5. I don't know how many times I read that before that became a reality to me. Like Al said a while ago, when people call in, they want you to pray for them. In my ministry center, that these numbers that we post, our telephone number and our website, we never pray for anybody without asking them what their sin is, what their relationship is with the Lord. Because it does very little to zero good to pray for someone without getting them to repent of their sin. And then after you get them to repent of their sin, you've got to build their faith because they have to come to God in faith. If you don't believe he'll do what he says he will do, you might as well have stayed at home. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I know the first majority of my life, I didn't realize God was a faith God. I didn't realize that when I asked him for something, I had to have every sin confessed, walking in obedience to his word because he says, I do not hear the prayer of a sinner. So I realized that if I wanted God to hear my prayers, I had to make sure my sins were confessed. When I confessed my sins, and then when I learned that he was a faith God, I had to come to him on behalf of his word, quoting his word, and believing his word, in faith, nothing wavering. That's when I began to see the Lord do great and mighty things in my life. So in our little ministry that we've got, the Living Savior Ministries, anytime anybody calls us for prayer or anytime anybody calls one of us, wants us to go to a hospital or go to a home or whatever, we don't just go over and pray for them. We find out where their faith is, build their faith, find out what their sin is and get it confessed. I am completely convinced that that's why we have such a tremendous track record of getting people healed. When I learned just asking in faith, in fact, I had a very large ministry, a man that back in January, I, I won't call his name, although he is a tremendous man of God, has a tremendous ministry, but his ministry is not healing. But he called me and was talking to me about some of these wonderful things God's doing. And he said, I've heard good things about your ministry. And I said, well, the Lord is doing some wonderful things. He said, I understand you get a lot of people healed. I said, yes, sir, we do get a lot of them healed. I said, we don't get them all healed, but we do get a lot of them healed. And he said, well, how do you do it? I told him, I said, I use the Word of God. 
He said, what scriptures do you use? And so I started out for an hour and a half. I quoted him scriptures. After an hour and a half, he said, I'm going to check you out. I said, okay. A couple of weeks later, he called me back and he says, I checked out every scripture you used in the Hebrew and the Greek, if it was Old or New Testament. And he said, you know what those verses say? In the Hebrew and the Greek, I said, yes, sir, I've checked them out already. They say the same exact thing they do in the English. He said, that's exactly right. He said, some of the promises and statements you're using in God's Word are so powerful. He said, I didn't dream God meant what He said. I said, well, see, that's how we get in trouble. We don't believe God. Now, if God made a statement telling you that sin brings forth death, why do we not believe that? That's powerful, isn't it? But it's obvious most of the church don't believe that either because if they did, they wouldn't be out sinning tomorrow. They'd be doing something else. You'd walk holy before God if you believed that your sin was going to start a death process in your body. Let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about right there. Let's, let's say somebody comes in and hands you a pack of cigarettes as a young person and says, let's smoke a cigarette. Okay, you try that. So you smoke a cigarette. Is one cigarette going to kill you? Probably not. Depends on what's in it. But probably not one regular cigarette won't kill you. But if you smoke a pack or two or three a day for 20 years, they will. What it did, it started a death process in your body, the very first one. And it went right down the line until it finally kills you. Some things work quicker than others. But when you open the door to some of these sexual sins, it really gets you. But anyway, this gentleman, he said, you know, this is amazing that you're getting all these people healed. I said, well, sir, it's just God's Word. So anyway, he later called me back one day and he said, Thurman, I got a problem. I said, what's that? He said, a young man that works for me in his 20s, he's already had back surgery once. And he said, now then he's down with his back again. He come in my office today with a walker. And he says, uh, the doctors gave him three different options and all of them were surgery in the long run. He said, I told him, I said, why don't we call Thurman and let's see what you say about this. I told him, I said, well, I'm going to give you a fourth option and it's Jesus. You know, that would have been my first option, Jesus. But it seems like we try everything before we come to Jesus. Because this young man had been to the doctor and they would told him, in fact, he'd already had surgery on his back once and now he's re ready to have it again. So anyway, I went to this young man. I talked to him for 45 minutes. I said, son, you're a Christian? Oh, yeah. I said, are you walking in obedience to God's Word? Oh, yeah. I said, well, I don't know if you are or not. I said, are you lying, stealing, cheating, living with some girl out of wedlock? No, no, no. He wasn't doing none of those things. He appeared, since he worked for this very good ministry, he appeared to be a very fine young man walking in all the faith he had. But he was still sick and afflicted, still down in his back. I told him, I said, son, you seem to meet all of the criteria God requires except one thing. He said, what's that? I said, your sin is unbelief for the promises of God. He said, sir, I believe God's word. I said, no, there's a problem here. He said, what do you mean? I said, you got a back problem and your schedule for surgery probably within 30 to 60 days, or at least that's what they told you is going to have to do. And I said, you've not went to God yet on behalf of his promises, have you? And he said, well, I guess I really haven't. I just got back from the doctor. I said, see, if you had taken Matthew 18, 19 and believed that, God would have healed your back. I said, since you got everything, since you're walking holy before God, and I asked him about his family life, and there was no curses that we could find, anything, because see, it's not always your sin. Sometimes it goes back three and four generations into the past until you learn that you have been redeemed from the curse of the law. But before you learn that, if you don't claim that at an early age, and then some kind of sickness and disease comes upon you, that curse from your father, your grandfather, or your great-grandfather, or anybody in that line back at least four generations could be bringing this sickness and disease upon you according to the Word of God, unless you had somebody born out of wedlock, and then it goes back 10 generations. And there's very few families that you can find today that if you go back 10 generations hadn't had somebody born out of wedlock. So the devil has an open door to us. There's no two ways about it. That's why we as the church needs to learn how to walk in faith and claim the redemption from the curse. So anyway, as this young man, I had him turn in his Bible to Matthew 18, 19. I said, turn over there, young man. I called his name and I said, read that promise to me. 
I have used this verse in Matthew 18, 19, I don't even know how many times. I mean, there's many, many wonderful promises in God's Word, but that just happens to be one of them. And that scripture clearly says, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask me for, it shall be done for you by my Father which is in heaven. An awesome statement, isn't it? But most of us don't believe it. Well, this young man obviously didn't, so that was his sin. I told him, I said, The sin of unbelief, according to Hebrews 3.12, is an evil heart of unbelief. I said, if you've got an evil heart of unbelief in you, God won't hear your prayer. He said, well, I didn't realize it was that serious. I said, it's very serious. I said, so what you need to do, <clears throat> you need to tell God you're sorry for not believing his promises. So that young man in his early 20s, right there on the phone with me and that other minister, the man in charge of the ministry, all listening on a conference call there, they were on a speaker phone, he heard everything I said in that 45 minutes. And then at the end of the 45 minutes, I said, now I have to pray for you in faith, nothing wavering. Because I said, if I waver at all when I pray, I said, I'm going to quote a verse to you out of James chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. When I pray, Jesus said in James 1, 6, but you must ask in faith, nothing wavering, nothing. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. That's pretty clear to me. So when I ask, I have to ask in faith, no doubt in my heart, no wavering, that if God made me a promise, it's a done deal. I got to believe that. So I pray that prayer of faith for him. And I said, now, do you agree with me? He said, I do. He said, it's written in God's Word. I said, okay, good. I looked at my watch and I said, oh, my goodness, son, I've got 10 minutes to get to a Bible study. I said, just a few minutes. I said, I don't have time to wait. I said, call me tomorrow with your praise report. Now, see, if you believe that, you believe God heard your prayer. Amen. I hung up the phone and run. I just barely got to the Bible teaching in time that night that I was teaching. The next morning at 7 o'clock, my phone was ringing. I got up and answered my telephone, and it was that minister. And he said, Thurman, five minutes after you hung up the phone yesterday, this young man that works for me was completely healed, running around all over the office doing everything he wanted to do. And said he played basketball last night and everything, and said he don't have a single pain this morning. Well, over the next uh, month or two, a couple of months, whatever it was, I prayed for a couple of other people in that man's office, and they were th the same thing. They were miraculously healed. Then the man that run the ministry was so, so inspired by what happened, he called me one day with another pastor of another huge church, and he had a son. And that son was in excruciating pain, torment. He called me first and said, Thurman, I've got a pastor friend of mine that's been in the ministry 50 years. He's got a son. And he said, uh, he's in pain, and I've seen God heal all these other people. Will you pray for him? I said, sure. He said, if I set up an appointment next Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, can you be available? I said, I will be. The next Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, my phone rang, and he said, I've got you now, and I've got the others. He said, I want you to talk to this young man and his daddy. Well, I know the man that run the ministry. I've never met him, but I've watched him on television lots of times. He's a very, very well-known pastor. Been in the ministry a long time. Great man of God. And if you ask him, you, he'd say, yes, I believe this book. But that's what I would have said too. I believe this book. So I talked to them two and a half hours on the phone. I talked to the young man at least an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, just a young man. But everybody was listening. And the one thing the young man would not do he would not repent of his sins. He would not acknowledge he had any kind of sin, and he would not repent. He said, finally, he said, I said, you know, son, the minute you repent and get right with God, he's going to heal you. He said, I'm tired of this. I've heard all I can stand. And he said, I'm, I'm going. I'm hurting. So he hung up the phone and left. His daddy come on the phone, and he told me, he said, Thurman, the gospel you're preaching is a condemning gospel. I said, sir, if the Word of God condemns you, 
then you're living in sin. The Word of God says it. I said, I will not whitewash the Word of God. I said, if the Word of God clearly says, when your heart condemns you not, you have the petition you ask of God. I said, I don't know your son, and I don't know you personally, but I have seen you on television a lot of times. But I'm going to tell you that your son has a sin, a besetting sin that Paul talked about in the book of Romans. And that besetting sin is keeping him bound. I said, I don't know what it is. But I said, he knows what it is. But I said, until that young man gets that sin confessed and he repents of it and turns from his wicked ways, I said, that young man's never going to get healed. When I learned all these principles and started questioning people, I started having very, very good response and started seeing Jesus heal a lot of people. Well, I hung the phone up, and they hung the phone up, and within just a couple of minutes, my phone rang again. And it was the head of this big ministry. He said, Thurman, I've seen it both ways. He said, I've seen people that repented now. Every person you prayed for that you talked to that repented, every one of them got healed. But he said, the ones that didn't, didn't. I said, beginning to make sense to you, isn't it? He said, yes, it is. He said, I'm going to have to change my doctrine. He said, now I understand why sometimes prayers get answered and sometimes they don't. He said, the Word of God is true exactly to the letter. I said, yes, sir. It's true to the letter. Now then, if you don't believe or you don't know this book, then you will not be able to get your prayer answered. But when you come to God, if you come to Him not in faith, you will not get your prayer answered. Here is a scripture in Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For the he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When you come to the Lord in faith, what does it mean to come to him in faith? It means to come to him on behalf of his word. If you don't have your sins confessed and you don't have enough faith, you'll be just like I was the first, you might say, 40 plus years of my life. I have been a Christian since I was 11. But I didn't know these things until the last 20 something years. When I began to get a hold of these principles, up until then, I had never seen God answer a prayer, although I'd been a Christian since I was 11. So for 30 years, I'd been a Christian Never seen a prayer answered. I've seen a lot of Christians like that. I was one of those. But when I got a hold of that and realized that I had to start walking not only holy, and I was trying to do that anyway. I was trying to walk in obedience to the Word, but I still didn't realize what faith was and that I had to come to God on behalf of His Word. When I learned that and I started quoting scriptures to the Lord after I made sure that all my sins were confessed. When my sins were confessed, then I could take the Word of God and quote it and ask the Lord to do something. He would do it. In fact, the first time I really remember doing that so boldly and so powerfully was in May of 1995. May of 1995, I went over to a house. I, teach, I was teaching these things in a Baptist church. I used to be in a Baptist church. And I was a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, and everything else in a Baptist church. And the Baptists loved God. A lot, of, a lot of Christians loved God. A lot of good people in all churches. But we didn't know and understand these principles. But I got revelation from the Lord on these things um, starting 27 years ago. And as I began to learn them, I began to teach them. And actually, the reason I started teaching them in a Baptist church is because the Lord came to me once. Friday night and told me, he said, son, I've now trained you where I want you to be, and I want you to start teaching just my word in your Baptist church. I said, okay, Lord. So I started teaching these things in a Baptist church in a Sunday school class, and at first it was so easy to get somebody healed. Everybody I prayed for was miraculously instantly healed. I, I thought this is the easiest thing I've ever seen. And then I found out it started getting harder. And I didn't understand what was going on. But as I started teaching these things, the Lord continued to teach me things and I began to learn. And finally, a couple 
that was in my Bible study class. <laughs> they came to me one Sunday afternoon and said, Thurman, we've been in church all of our life. We've never heard the Scriptures taught like you teach them. But what you teach is exactly what the Word of God says. So we need a miracle. I said, what do you need? They said, Philip, our 11-year-old son, has had warts and scars all over his body since he was three. And so I said, okay. So I went over there at that house and I looked at that little 11 year old boy and he, I never seen a child with more warts on his body than that 11 year old child. And a few years ago they had burned two big rows of them off the back of his right hand and the big old warts came right back in the scars and left two huge scars on the back of his right hand. They had tried everything and nothing worked. Everything but Jesus, everything but faith. Doctors couldn't do nothing for him, and the little boy hated it, so I got all their sins confessed, found out what all their sins were, got everybody's sins confessed, even the sin of unbelief and everything, in May of 1995. And then again, I took that magnificent promise in Matthew 18, 19. I mean, I have used that promise for no, I couldn't even tell you how many miracles I've seen God do with Matthew 18, 19. But I used that Matthew 18, 19, and we knelt on the floor, and I prayed the prayer of faith for that young boy and asked the Father in Jesus' name to take those warts off that little boy's body. And then we stood up from there and I said, now then, I said, I guarantee you, first of all, the mother said, when are they going to come off? I said, ma'am, that's the only thing God don't tell me is when. When I pray the prayer of faith, he can do it instantly. They could fall off right now. It may take a week. It may take a month. I don't know how long it'll take, but I said, it's got to happen because I prayed in faith and I said, if you stay in faith with me, they got to come off because God made the promise. I said, I guarantee they'll come off because God said they would. I said, now, but you got to stay in faith. I said, I'll promise you something else. When I walk out that door, there'll be a demon come in here and he'll put a thought in your mind. You don't really think those warts and scars are going to come off of that boy's body. After all, he's had them 11 years and remember the doctors couldn't even take them off. I said, so, but don't you believe that? I said, when that thought comes to your mind from the devil, I said, you run over and you open your Bible to Matthew 18, 19, and you read that scripture to the devil. You tell him where to go. And I said, he'll leave you. And I said, if you stay in faith, I guarantee you Philip's warts and scars will come off. Well, the next morning, mother goes in to check Philip, and all the warts on the ends of the little boy's fingers and up under his fingernails were completely gone overnight. Now, let me tell you, when a mother sees the tangible results of her miracle, it's difficult from this point on to deceive her. I mean, she's locked in now. But if you got something else wrong with you, you may not be able to see God inside of you working. But He's working as long as you're working in or you're li believing in faith. She could see the results. So er over the next three weeks, every ward on that little boy's body went away. Now, that mother was the happiest woman I'd ever seen in a Baptist church that third Sunday. In fact, I've made this statement lots of times. You don't see a charismatic Baptist church member very often, but I saw one that Sunday. That woman was charismatic. She was jumping, screaming, praising God in church. Can you imagine? She had seen the Lord do the first thing, a miraculous thing she had ever seen. So she said, look, Thurman, the only thing is left is those two big scars on the back of Philip's hand. I told her, I said, ma'am, don't stop believing now. Continue to believe and you will get to see the glory of God as he continues to take off those scars. Whatever you do, keep praising him and thanking him and worshiping him and they will go away because Matthew 18, 19 made you a promise. I said, all of y'all's sins are repented of. God promises that all of his promises in his word, the answers to all of his promises are yes and amen for his obedient believers every time. So I said, he never says no to an obedient believer when you're walking holy before him. I said, so he has to do it. He said it. So as long as you stay in faith, they will come off. Well, of course, the next Sunday when she come to church, Philip had no scars on the back of his hand. They were gone. Even the scars were taken off. What is it that we don't understand about God? I know it all depends on how big your Jesus is. As I taught that one time, Cheryl sat down and wrote a song about how big is your Jesus. And that's going to be one of our new songs. Uh, I don't know if she has that uh, 
Ready or Not, but she, that's one of her songs that she's written. And nearly all of these songs she's come up with that she's writing, I would make a statement or talk about something and she'd lock onto it with the notes she's taking and the Lord would quicken her heart and she'd go sit down and write a song around these scriptures. And that's where all these songs that she's written has come from. But if you're going to get into a business of getting God to answer your prayer, the first thing you need to do is make sure you belong to Jesus. The next thing you need to make sure that you got the Holy Spirit. Make sure that you have the baptismal power of the Holy Ghost living in you. So you got that power so He'll talk to you. Then the next thing you need to make sure is you know what faith is. You need to make sure you're walking holy with every sin confessed. If you will do that, when you come to the Lord on behalf of His Word and ask Him for something in faith, He will do it. In fact, in March, when I was back down at that church in Louisiana, I got to see the Lord do one of the most awesome things I've seen Him do since He healed my granddaughter. I was there and there was a man, I don't know how old Johnny Brumfield is, but I'm guessing I use his name because this is such an awesome miracle. I don't know how old Johnny is. I'm guessing he's in his 50s. I don't know. But Johnny, two years ago, this last June, he was in an accident and a tractor ran over his knees. When that tractor ran over his knees and crushed them, the doctors told him after they looked at his knees, said, you'll never walk again. Never. The doctors done everything they could do and he had not walked in 21 months when I was there. But they brought him to church that night. Two crushed knees with steel braces on both legs to hold the legs straight. After speaking about two hours, I asked if there's anybody who needed prayer. Several people came forward. I prayed for them. And I looked over and saw him sitting over there. And I said, sir, do I need to pray for you for something? He said, yes, sir, I'd love it. He said, my knees were crushed in a tractor accident nearly two years ago. And he said, the doctor said, I'll never walk again. I said, do you believe the doctors or you believe God? He said, I believe God. He said, I believe I'll walk. He said, you pray for me and I believe I'll walk. I said, you're, do, you're believing the right things. I turned to a scripture. Of course, I have it memorized. But in John 14, 13, and 14, Jesus said, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, the name of Jesus, he will do it for you. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? I had my sins confessed. I was walking in obedience to the Word, and I asked him the same thing. He said, I've got my sins confessed, and I'm walking in obedience to the Word also. I said, good. I knelt down there and prayed for that man and asked the Lord on behalf of John 14, 13, and 14 to heal and restore Johnny's knees. And then I thanked the Lord for doing it. And then I asked him if he'd take those steel braces that was under his pants off and throw them away. And he pulled his bridge's leg up and throwed those things away, throwed them down in the floor. And I reached up and took him by the hand and I said, now then rise and walk, sir, in the name of Jesus. He rose up out of that seat, stood up, and the first words out of his mouth was, oh, it hurts. I said, sir, I know it hurts. But I said, the devil's going to make it hurt. But I said, don't believe the devil. Believe the Word of God. I said, walk. And I give him a tug. And he took one step, two steps, three steps. I turned him loose. He walked around the platform three times and bro broke and run to the front of the church and all the way back screaming, God is awesome. The man was completely healed right before our very eyes. Goodness, do we serve an awesome God. If you'll believe, Jesus will do the same thing for you. But you must make sure you get your sins confessed first.